Alex Kingston. Hello, sweeties. Got the phone, I'm gonna put the phone here. How are you all doing? I think I've probably met most of you this weekend, but um, this way you get to see my shoes. <laughs> Hi. I love that they are too, might I add. <laughs> For those in the back who can't see them. Wow, it's really bright up here, I just <laughs> have to let you know. So um, I can't see anybody, but um, I, I'm sure you are all out there because you're making a lot of noise. Yes. Are, are you making a lot of noise, everyone? <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing good. Yes, we missed you last year. We were most sad. <laughs> oh, I know. Can I tell you, I spent the whole weekend apologizing to fans. <laughs> because boy do they tell me, do they tell me how much I let them down. Um, um, but the truth is that I, I, my intentions had been to come here. I didn't, I didn't not come here because I was doing a job, which is normally what happens, but I was, um, I was in the process of being made a United States citizen. And I didn't realize that uh, there's, a, there's a period of time in that process where you're not allowed to leave the country. Um, and so it was exactly at that moment when um, the Edmonton Convention was happening and I, I wasn't allowed to leave, I couldn't leave. But I've made up for it now. <laughs> the way I look at it. River Song would probably have her second appearance be first at an Edmonton Expo, so you're just playing the form. Yeah, the truth is, River Song wouldn't need to be an American citizen. She's a citizen of the universe. <laughs> but um, yeah, I had I had to become a citizen um, because I I was aware that Donald Trump might become president. <laughs> So I needed a get out, <laughs> a get out plan. I reminded everyone to vote when they can. <laughs> uh, it's somewhat famous now. There's a reaction clip of you on stage at another convention on a weekend in July, where you literally hear firsthand, we see your reaction at Jodie Whittaker being announced as the new Doctor Who. Sort of, we were all busy, sort of in the middle of kind of giving some probably very boring answer, and um, um, I, you know, I was aware that all of a sudden there was the attention was sort of a, away from us. Like people were all kind of on their phones. You can tell when people are distracted or not really listening anymore. So it, we had to. It was like, what on earth is going on? And then all the fans just went. The new doctor's been announced, so um, yeah, it was fantastic, fantastic. My second wife. <laughs> you have to come back to the show now because <laughs> I, know. I am so intrigued to see what River would do with, not necessarily do, <laughs> how River would react to yeah. this new female doctor. How do you think she would? Oh, I think she'd just take her in her arms and give her a big kiss. <laughs> um, uh, I, th I mean, I think it will be fantastic. Uh, it will be great. I think it will be great fun to explore um, that possibility, uh, particularly now that um, the Doctor is going to regenerate into a female form. Uh, so if you're going to do that, then why not explore sort of other potentials in terms of his relationship with um, former... Um, well, not former companions, because River was never a companion, but certainly people who have been in his life in the past, or in her life, I don't quite know now what you say in... in <laughs> um, uh, so, um, yeah, let's wait and see. Um, certainly, uh, River is, um, I mean, given that she has a vortex manipulator, and given that, in a sense, her timeline has somewhat been bookended, it doesn't, though, necessarily mean, given the way she time travels, that it would prevent her from being able to travel and meet this incarnation. 
after all, when she when she lifts up, uh, when she opens her diary, and all the all the incarnations um, uh, flutter out, uh, there are one or two um, spaces. So uh, I think that I think it'd be great if she met with um, Jodie Whittaker's doctor and with Captain Jack Harkness. Do you, do you get that one a lot? I mean, you were on Arrow, and Cap, uh, John Barrow was on Arrow. You weren't actually in many scenes, but everyone no. keeps saying River Jack. No, you know, it's funny because John and I, um, we, we talk about, uh, or, or, you know, we imagine, we fantasize about um, all the possibilities. And certainly on Arrow, I was like, oh, for goodness sake. You know, I've been brought on to Arrow because the writers are um, a big Doctor Who fans. And um, John is on Arrow. Surely they're going to try and figure out some kind of storyline. You know, maybe Dinah Lance could be having an affair with Malcolm Merlin or something. I don't know. But um, but they just never went down that route, which is a bit of a shame, really. Uh, but certainly, um, I think now that Chris Chibnall is show running, it would be it, it would kind of be fantastic, even if there was a sort of. Not necessarily a spin-off show, but it, it kind of would be great if, if maybe even the Doctor happened upon a bar in the universe where River and Captain Jack happened to be sitting, having a drink or something, you know, and I, mean, it would, I think it'd be cool. So, tweet about it. <laughs> Yeah, because, I mean, when you did the, your last story to date, I hasten to add, the uh, Husband's River song, yeah. did you get the impression that that perhaps is sort of a, a winding down, a closure of, of, of the river arc, or did you feel like it could be No, going well, um, no, I don't, because I think, uh, I don't know, I feel Stephen Moffat, and obviously Stephen is now no longer show running, um, but... I think Stephen is very uh, attached to the character of River, and so it, I mean he killed her off right at the beginning. <laughs> but um, but I think that um, it sort of was not easy for him to necessarily completely let her go. Uh, hence, I think the reason why um, one night on Derillium is 25 years. Um, you know, we're not even past breakfast yet. <laughs> I mean, it's early days. It's early days, uh, yeah. I'm sure that Chris Chibnall hasn't, like, phoned you up yet uh, to say that, would you like to be in Doctor Who next year? No, well, if he had, spoilers, <laughs> would I say? Obviously, you would like to reprise the role in the new era, though. I mean, how, how would that be? I mean, you've always, like, sort of, like, worked under Stephen Moffat's kind of... Uh, well, that's you know. the thing. Stephen wouldn't let anybody else write for my character. Um, so um, it's whether he now graciously releases River into the hands of other writers. Um, it would be nice if he did. Um, uh, so we'll see. Speaking of being a proprietorial, I understand that Matt Smith was a little proprietorial over, over River when you appeared with Peter Capaldi, is that he true? He was, he was really cross. <laughs> he was really cross. In fact, um, because I didn't, I didn't tell him. I didn't want him to know. Uh, I mean, because I knew he might have sort of feelings about it. And I already knew, I'd already said I would do it. I'd already been offered and told um, about the episode. And um, so I didn't tell him. And um, he found out. And it was on my wedding day. It was at my wedding, um, which I had invited him to. Um, he came up to me, at, you know, while we're all dancing and having a great time. He came up to me and was like, I hear you're doing Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> like, all kind of, like, bristly. And, and I was like, yeah, I am. And he's like, I told Stephen I didn't want you to do Doctor Who with anybody other than me. <laughs> it was really... <laughs> and, um, yeah, he was, he was a little bit pissed. And then I was like, you know what, Matt? If I can't work on Doctor Who, I'm not earning money. So it's all, it's all right for you, you know, you're going off and doing other jobs, but you're preventing me from actually making a living, so get over it. <laughs> He's becoming obsessive about Doctor Who. I think he phoned or he demanded someone tell him who Jodie, who the next Doctor was going to be before it came out. Did he really? Yeah. 
it, Typical. I know. It, it, it's funny because uh, you're, uh, you obviously were in uh, Silence at the Library, but your first day on set in Stephen Moffat's era was the first day on set for Matt and Karen as well, and they were puppies back then. Well, actually, um, Stephen Moffat wrote Silence in the Library. He did, yeah. He was under, under Russell T. Davis, yeah. who was the showrunner at the time, but Stephen was sort of Russell's main man. And um, so... Uh, yeah, so I mean, I worked with Stephen and David Tennant. Yeah. Um, but yes, I, I worked with Matt on his very, I mean, I was there from the incarnation of Matt um, because they swapped the shooting days around so that um, uh, the, the, the very first episode that Matt appears in wasn't the first episode that he shot. Um, he actually, I think the first episode was episode three, I think it was, with me. Um, uh, which they did deliberately because they wanted to um, allow him to sort of, basically they wanted to allow him a bit of time to mess up. Um, and he was under such pressure and the media was so sort of scrutinizing and were going to scrutinize the very first episode that um, I thought it was very clever that the BBC just thought, well we'll, well, we'll shoot episode three first so that if he's a nervous wreck, nobody will notice because they will already have watched episode one or two. But he wasn't, I mean, my God, he took to it like a duck to water. It was fantastic. <laughs> So how was, how was Peter Capaldi then, by comparison? Uh, Peter, I was I was nervous of working with Peter because um, I'm a fan of him, and uh, you know he's such an experienced actor, and um, you know I'd loved him in the sh the TV show In the Thick of It, uh, and you know I've known him sort of always playing slightly sort of neurotic, angry men, um, and uh, so I was kind of a little bit nervous, um, but. Uh, Oh, it was so lovely to work with him, and he was, I think, so relieved because he'd had such an intense uh, season, and it had been a very dark season, and Jenna had, you know, she departed, and um, uh, and so for him, even though he was pretty burnt out, I mean, this is the thing, whoever plays the Doctor, and um, Jodie Whittaker will, will not actually really know what she's in for until she's literally in the thick of it because you burn out playing the doctor you i mean you're in every scene and they work you extremely hard and when you're not working filming you're being whisked off doing um uh press conferences uh attending different meetings i mean it's just it's non-stop and you have to learn all of these lines and be ready to know them the next day and i mean it's very 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 intense so when i went to do the christmas special with peter he was Fried because he'd done this very intense season. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it was great because we could have a laugh. And um, I think that's really what he needed. So it was it was good. Yeah, Matt Lucas was there too, speaking of laughs. Oh gosh, he's yeah. lovely. Oh, he's so lovely. I'm super jealous that he came back. I mean, like, what the hell? <laughs> He's in a robot, um, but he's he's lovely, and actually, um, he's the, absolutely the right sort of person to be on a show like that because he's got such fantastic humour and he can improvise and and really make scenes work very well. Um, now, there's you have a little game to play with the audience today. I do. Um, I'm intrigued by this, so please explain what you want to do. There's an audience participation aspect okay. of the show. Okay. Um, so uh, we're going to do. We're going to change things up a little bit because I know you're expecting that people are going to be standing in line and they're going to ask questions, and I'm just going to answer. So I've just thought, you know what? Let's just change it up a little bit before we before we do that. Um, so I'm going to ask you some questions. <laughs> And if you get them right, you get to come up on stage and play some more. <laughs> so, we're going to do a little bit, first of all, we're going to do some true or false, okay? Now, the only thing is, um, I guess basically, I can just about see you actually. So, this is going to be down to our lovely helpers in their blue t-shirts. Um, I'm going to ask a true or false question. 
and your, I guess the audience can put up their hands and um, whoever gets the question right, think about it if you want to participate because if you get it right, it means you're going to have to come up on this stage and play some more. Um, and, but if you get it right, uh, yeah, they, they'll they'll tell you to come up here. So, are you in? Are you up for playing? Yeah. Okay. okay. So you guys are going to have to pick somebody who's got their hand up, okay? And just grab and just put the. Can you do that, you guys in blue? All right. Okay. Here we go. True or false? Tardis and Dalek have been added to the Oxford English Dictionary. Okay, okay, guy who's going to ask the question, he's got his hand up, he's taller than everybody in the, yeah, in the black there. And he was first too, I think. Well, I am trying to look like hot now, but they definitely have been put in the Oxford Dictionary. I usually keep a track on that one. Absolutely true. Come up on stage. All right, second question. Okay, guys in blue, you've got, to, you've got to be on it. You've got to be a bit quicker than this. You're standing there like lemons. All right. <laughs> okay. True or false? Douglas Adams, who wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, wrote scripts for Doctor Who. Okay, that lady bouncing over there. True, come on up, come on the stage. Okay, you can just, you can stand there. Yeah, don't get closer, don't get closer, stay there. Okay. There's only one TARDIS left in the universe. True or false? I saw a girl way, way back, in behind there, who, now you, yeah, the one who turned around, that one was up first. The, the one beside you, right there. Yep, that's who. Yeah, that's false. It's false, yes, it's false. There's more than one TARDIS in the universe. Okay. These are pretty easy, huh? <laughs> but uh, it's because I want you up on stage. <laughs> um, all right. TARDIS stands for Time and Rescue Dimension in Space. True or false? Not even close. Yes. Miss, miss... That's false. What does it stand for? Time and Relative Dimension in Space. Absolutely true. Come on up. All right, we've got two more left. The Doctor first met Martha on the moon. True or false? Okay, lady over there, yes. Lady who's got, who, yes, you, yes, you, my mummy. Yes, you. <laughs> it's true. It's false. Uh -uh. <laughs> Sit back down. He met Martha in a hospital on Earth, which then went to the moon. <laughs> How they did that, I do not know. But it's... So Sorry, Mummy. <laughs> okay, last one. Which of the Doctor's enemies had a Christmas novelty record? What? Ooh. I don't think they have it. This is a deep cut. This is a trick question. Oh, right over there in the stands. Hang on, late. the lady here, she's oh. doing an arm. Daleks? Yes! <laughs> Do you know what it was called? I don't know what it was called. Does anybody know what it was called? Yes. <laughs> There's a man at the front there. It wasn't called Dalek, I love you. Was it called? Oh, there's a lady there pointing at somebody. Daleks of Christmas? Mm, not quite good enough. Something to do with it. Shall I tell you? Just as a piece of trivia. You're not coming on the stage. <laughs> but I'll tell you anyway. It was called, I'm gonna spend my Christmas with a Dalek. <laughs> and the band who sang it, were called the Go-Go's, and it was in the 1960s. Oh. It's pretty cool, actually. It's very funny, very silly. Okay, are you my winners? Fantastic, come on over.
over here. Now it gets interesting. Okay, all line up. Line up here in front. You've got to sh show yourselves to the audience. Okay, uh, you all know my catchphrases. Spoilers and hello, sweetie. So I'm going to pass my microphone down the line and each of them is going to have to give their best impression of River Song, <laughs> saying, first of all, hello sweetie, and then spoilers. So we'll start with hello sweetie, and it's up to you guys to judge who's the best. Okay, let's start with hello sweetie. Okay, this hello sweetie. Hello sweetie. Hello, sweetie. Hello, sweetie. Hello, sweetie. <laughs> the episode to see his works and see how appreciated he has become and how valued his um, works of art are and it absolutely makes me cry every single time because um, you know there are so many people who have done incredible things and never know or have never realized how they have touched people um, uh, how important they are to people um, and so for one moment in Doctor Who we get to see somebody actually see it so I, that's very special to me Hi um, My question 
question was kind of already taken by him, but um, uh, but you're gonna ask it anyway. Well, it's, it's different. It's different. Okay. Um, with the thirteenth Doctor, um, if River had met her again, do you think she'd know right away? And how do you think the dynamic would be different? Um. Gosh, well, I don't know. I guess it's up to the writers, really. Um, I mean, River didn't know Peter Capaldi's doctor. So, um, although I, you know, I do say, uh, you remind me of my second wife, I'm just assuming she's my second wife because Cleopatra is my first. Um, who knows, maybe she's my fourth wife, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's sort of really, it's, it's a question that I can't really answer. Um, what do you think? I don't know. <laughs> I, I think I'd hope she would, because I think that would be funny. Yeah, I think it would be funny too. I'd love to say to her, hello, sweetie. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hi. Hello. Uh, my question is about Gilmore Girls, but with a little bit of a twist. How do you think River would react to interacting with Naomi Shropshire? Oh my god. Um, well, I think they'd really enjoy a martini together, that's for sure. <laughs> they'd probably get hammered. Um, <laughs> So, um, yeah, I think, I think actually it would be kind of great fun because they're two extremely eccentric characters. <laughs> yes, it's all about the martinis. <laughs> Hello. Hello again. So you've been cast as a lot of very strong, saucy women. Yes. And so um, I was curious because you've described yourself as feeling quite vulnerable and sensitive. So I wanted to know if playing the roles like River or Lady Macbeth. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, if they have influenced your own personality at all. Do you know, that's a really interesting question. It's a good question because um, when I was at drama school, um, I was never cast in any of the sort of vulnerable uh, female roles. I was always sort of playing the kind of the older mother parts or the sort of the strong females. And then when I graduated from drama school and I started working in theater, again, I never got to play the ingenue roles. I never got to play Juliet. I never got to play Ophelia. And I'm just talking Shakespeare because that's sort of all you can think about when you're a drama student. Um, and the only ingenue role I ever got to play was Cordelia um, from King Lear. And the production, I was sort of kick-ass. Um, and I, I never, I never um, saw myself like that because actually, hard as it may be to believe, I'm quite shy. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know it shows, it really does. <laughs> I am actually quite shy. And, um, and I think a lot of actors are shy. And, uh, and in fact, it's kind of bizarre that we choose this profession. It's sort of in a weird way, it, it allows us to actually be able to kind of get through that. Um, and very often you get through it because you're actually being somebody else. You're, you're, um, you're not really yourself. Like I could never stand on stage when I was younger. I could do it now. I mean, look at me, I'm standing on stage. Um, but when I was younger, I could never stand on stage and do something like recite poetry because that would be me being, you know, vulnerable in front of you. But I could play a character because that's not me. Um, so uh, I'm glad though now that I, that I do play strong characters and I, I realize, I mean, aside from physically, you know, because I'm, I'm strongly built, I'm not, I'm not sort of waif-like at all. Uh, so more than anything, I mean, the guys couldn't lift me. <laughs> so I couldn't play the ingenues. Um, the, the actor who played King Lear, John Wood, um, he tried to lift me and he actually um, did his back in. <laughs> uh, so um, it was very bad actually. He actually couldn't perform. <laughs> so uh, yeah, but I, I'm, I'm happy. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that I play strong, um, strong female roles because I think actually it sends a really good message to, um, to young women out there. So, yeah.
Bring it on. Thank you. Hi. Mine's a little bit more on the fluffy side, but what was the most uncomfortable piece of costume or accessory or shoes that oh, you ever Don't had? stop right there. I know already my answer. Those bloody fucking oh, sorry. and I said no. <laughs> so Matt Smith took them instead. <laughs> Say no more. Hello, I was wondering who's your favorite doctor and why? <gasps> well, how can I have a favorite when they're all the same person? <laughs> I can't really, because they're, they're the same, deep down, they're the same person, the same spirit, the same with all the memories and everything, so they're the same person, it's just that they come in different shapes and sizes. <laughs> That's for the older generation. is Matt Smith and I'm just wondering what your best moment working on set with us and if you pulled any pranks on each other. Um, do you know it's funny because uh, when I was working on ER uh, we were being we were we were being pranked all the time and um, uh, it sort of it was just how it was that was your that was your day-to-day -day existence being pranked by George Clooney or you know but, but um, uh, the one thing about working on Doctor Who, or actually a lot of um, shows in England, is we don't have we don't have the money to afford to spend the time pranking. So it's very the work is very intense, and um, every single second counts. Um, and so, uh, literally, it's it sort of it's like a, a blot on your CV if you wasted time pranking. Um, so they don't, which is a real shame because, um, you know, pranks can be fantastic, especially for a blooper reel. Um, but, uh, so the only things that would happen would be if something actually went wrong. Um, I mean, my favourite, I mean, okay, I loved slapping Matt across the face. <laughs> And I think we had to do that take eight times or something. And um, and I like to do it for real because uh, because I I just think that you know that thing looks just fake. So you know the first couple of times Matt was kind of pretty humorous about it, but he started to get pissed, <laughs> um, which I found very amusing actually. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so that was fun. It was fun um, kneeing him in his private parts. Um, when, in fact, that's the first time that um, River met him, when she flies through the universe and he catches her in the TARDIS. And uh, we did that. And um, yes, I, I need him in, the, uh, in those cojones. Uh, which again, I thought was rather funny. Um, and I thought he was laughing as well, but actually he wasn't. <laughs> um, so does that answer your question? Good. Yes, thank you. <laughs> oh, you didn't get a banana, so you're back for more, are you? Well, I have to at least cue something, but I want to ask you about the most complex thing that we've ever seen on Doctor Who, and that is River Song. We see her at first when she dies, and then you're going backwards in time, 
And then eventually when you actually figure out that she's the daughter of two companions, then things go forward and then you find out. But I want you to comment on Moffat's imagination to bring on some complexity and you performing in that complexity. Uh, well, um, of course, when I was uh, um, given the opportunity to play the part, I just thought it was a two-episode story arc where I came on, um, I, I sacrificed myself, and um, I died. And the tragedy was that obviously there had been a relationship between the two of them that we would never know about. Um, and, uh, and I thought that was that. Um, and um, Stephen didn't tell anybody, although Russell says he had an inkling um, that uh, this character that Stephen had created would be back because he just thought she's too complex of a character to just kind of discard. Um, so Stephen, Stephen has thrown these incredible sort of threads out. They're like, it's sort of almost like, you know, threads from a spider's web um, that just sort of float around in Storyland until he chooses to reconnect them and for that thread of story to continue. And it's kind of amazing um, because those threads can float around waiting to be continued for two seasons. I mean, you don't even know that he's dropped, you know, that he's created that sort of red herring or whatever. Um, and it's just the, it's his genius. I don't know how he does it. All I can say is that as actors, you don't ask questions, you just roll with it, and you just know and trust that Stephen knows what he's doing. <laughs> That's all you can do. And he writes Sherlock at the same time. I mean, it's crazy, crazy. Okay, we got Thank time you. for two questions, I think. That and then one more from over there. Hello, Miss Kingston, how are you? Hello, I'm very well, thank you. Uh, my question is, which was more difficult to remember and uh, rehearse, uh, sorry, perform during a scene? The technical uh, medical terms you did on ER or the made-up technical <laughs> sci-fi mumbo-jumbo of Doctor Who? That's a very good question. Um, the, on ER, uh, I would learn my lines uh, the night before and um, I would have a sense of them but I knew that I wouldn't really, they wouldn't really sink in until I really knew what it was I was doing. And um, before we actually came to shoot uh, the, the scene, the medical scene, we would work with um, doctors who were our consulting supervisors and they were with us all the time. And so we would spend time in the OR or in the ER and we would go through the, the scene and the dialogue and the procedure that it corresponded with. And so actually it became incredibly easy. It was like almost like natural that you'd say what you say because it was part of the procedure you were doing. Doctor Who? Who knows? I mean, it's just gobbledygook. It's so, it's not easy at all to remember those lines. But I don't have to say the really difficult lines. I, I just have the fabulous lines, um, which are so easy to remember. But the people who play the Doctor, I mean, Matt Smith, my God, they, they really, I mean, they have pages and pages of just like, um, and there's no consultants, alien consultants helping them. So, um, no, so ER was far easier, actually. Thank you. Last Thank you question, much. right there. Hi. First of all, Stephen, I love your podcast. Thank you. And Alex, I was just wondering, if River Song ever met Missy, how do you think the two of them would react to each other? Oh, I would so love that. I, I was longing for that potentially to happen because Michelle Gomez is fantastic. She is mad as a box of frogs. <laughs> but really, we could have had some fun. Of course, River would have won. Um, but, um, but it would have been so much fun because they're equally mischievous. Um, so it's a shame though because, well, who knows, who knows? Never say never, eh? She could be back. Yeah.
Thank you. Th thank you all for the questions. Okay, okay, yep. come on then. Right, I need to hear you all do it, okay? Thank you.